We're going to turn now to looking at some properties of indefinite integrals, which a lot of them you're actually going to know already from your work with definite integrals. Uh, essentially, we want to just revisit the idea that you can reverse any derivative formulas you know uh, to generate integration formulas. And again, all the work that you've done with antiderivatives and definite integrals uh, pays off big time here. First one that you came across when you're working with derivatives was this uh, working with power functions and you might have called it the power rule. Uh, the fact that the derivative of x to the n to find the derivative you put that n in front and decrease that exponent by one. So multiplied by n and then drop the power by one. To go backwards you're going to do the reverse of that. You're going to increase the power by one x to the n plus one and you're going to divide by that new power, all right, plus a constant there. Now we're going to come back in a second to this idea of why this it can't be negative one there, okay? And it has to do with this. We're going to leave that for a second. Uh, we're going to turn to some other ones that are hopefully pretty straightforward here. This might have been your favorite derivative to find. Uh, derivative e to the x is e to the x. It's its own derivative. So as you'd expect, the integral of e to the x is e to the x plus some constant. If you have some other exponential function, a to the x, some other a standing for any uh, any base, we found that it was almost its own derivative, but you had to multiply by ln a. So when you find the integral, you've got to do the opposite of that. You're going to end up having a to the x divided by, oops, divided by ln a plus some constant. If you want to see that, you could change this around just slightly here. You can see why. You could divide both sides by ln a, right? I could put 1 over ln a in here, and you could actually put that inside. So I could write it as derivative of a to the x over ln a equals a to the x, right? And so when you look at the integral of that, right, if derivative of this is this, integral of this is that. So that's why that, that's why that works there. Some of the other ones we turn to uh, is uh, some trig derivatives here. You have the, tr the derivatives of these six basic trig functions. And some of them were nice and straightforward and you like them. Derivative of sine was cos. Derivative of cos was minus sine. I think you eventually accepted that minus sine. Tangent was secant squared. Cotangent was minus cosecant squared. And then derivative of secant was secant tangent. And cosecant was negative cosecant cotangent. Now, since we know those six formulas, we can turn them around. If derivative of sine is cosine, integral of cosine is sine plus a constant. If derivative of cos is minus sine, integral of sine is going to be minus cos, right? Because we could as before here, we could times both sides here by negative 1, right? Put a negative in front there, and that gives us our integral of negative cos is positive sine, right? Derivative of tan is secant squared, so integral of secant squared is tangent plus a constant. And similarly here, this is going to be minus cotangent. And then down here, um, Derivative of secant is secant tangent, so integral of secant tangent is secant plus a constant. And similarly down here, cosecant. Now you might think that's sort of bizarre. Here we had these nice derivative formulas for our six basic trig functions in yellow there, except I erased one. But now we've got integral of, well, these are our basic trig functions, but then these are these bizarro expressions. And it might not happen that often where you're looking for derivatives of those, but, or where you're looking for integrals of those, but you've got them, you have to be able to recognize them if just by turning around those derivative formulas. All right? Later on, once we learn a few other things, we're going to be able to get integral of the six basic trig functions. We've already got two. But we need a few other things first before we can do integral of tan x and integral of cotangent of x and stuff. So you're going to have to put that on the back burner for now. And the last thing I want to remind you about here is 
when we looked at um, inverse trig functions, you found derivative of arctan was 1 over 1 plus x squared. So we can say integral of 1 over 1 plus x squared dx is arctan plus a constant. Now that one always seems to trouble people because they think, I think it's, uh, you know, uh, the fact that you got derivative of a trig function, then whoa, what is this? This is suddenly something that doesn't have trig function in it at all. And then when you turn it around, it's even worse because it's uh, it seems like out of the blue here, right? Integral of something nice looks like this algebraic expression. What? What do you mean it's arctangent? All right? So you have to just learn to watch for it. And then uh, the other one here, integral of 1 over whoops, square root 1 minus x squared is oops, dx is arc sine plus a constant. So that's not necessarily more to memorize, it's just understanding the concept that you can turn these derivative formulas around to get integral formulas. And we're going to come back to that one, that kind of that exception that I talked about there. The exception to that power rule where um, you have integral of x to the n dx is x to the n plus 1 times 1 over n plus 1 plus a constant except n cannot be negative 1. Think about what would happen here, right? If you're working with this, we'll write this over on the side here. If we can fit it. If you have x to the 3, the integral is a quarter x to the 4th. The integral of x to the 2 is one third x to the third. Integral of x or x to the one is one half x squared. Integral of x to the zero, that's like a constant, right? That's just one. Um, the integral of that is, well, you could say it's uh, x to the one times one over one if you really want to, but it's just x. Now, if you had, say, x to the negative three, it's got to bump it up one x to the negative two and divide here, negative that, right? Divide by negative 2. And if you have x to the negative 2, it's going to be up to negative 1 here. And we got 1 over negative 1. And the 1 in the middle there that I skipped is the exception. All right? If you have x to the negative 1, that's just 1 over x. The reason is because think about this here. If you bump the power up when you get 0 and you got 1 over 0, that, that doesn't work. That doesn't follow. 1 over x uh, was the derivative of something completely different. 1 over x was the derivative of natural logarithm of x. Okay? So why is it an exception? Because it's, uh, its integral is something totally different. Its integral is natural log of absolute value of x plus a constant. Now, you might recognize it just as natural log of x, but there's a reason we need this absolute value there. The absolute value, if you think about the graph here, natural log graph looks something like this. So when you say, what's the derivative of natural logarithm? Log x. It is. It happens to be this graph right here, 1 over x. Right? The slope is getting less and less, but it's always still positive, the slope of this graph. Now, if we go backwards here and we say integral of 1 over x and we say it's ln x, the problem is 1 over x also exists on this side. Now the slope's exactly the same. The area is going to be the opposite, the area underneath. And what you need to do here is put this absolute value in there because what that does is it reflects this graph onto the other side here so that you have the same thing on the other side, right? The values are, well, not the same thing, the opposite, right? If you don't have that, um, if you don't have that absolute value there, that graph doesn't even exist over there. So you, it, it needs to exist for the same values, right? This function is, exists where x is greater than zero, but this function exists everywhere except where x is zero. So it matches this because that's what this is. This, everything except for zero. So that's a little bit of why you need that absolute value in there, but that's a tough one to recognize because people uh, flail away with trying to 
make sense of this. They try to write something here like this, and it obviously doesn't make any sense. Okay, that's not it. You got to recognize that that is the derivative of natural logarithm. All right. So if you didn't put that back up in the list up here, you could put that one. This is ln absolute value of x plus a constant. Okay, now that seems like a lot of information, but uh, as you work with integrals, you will uh, sort some of these things out. We're going to turn now to using some of these properties to evaluate uh, various integrals in the next part.